All right. Good evening, Mike. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing awesome. Doing awesome. Looks like summer's summer's trying to set in here. I don't know about is where you are. It's about 91, 92 here today. Uh, high 80s today. It's supposed to be in the 90s this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting to be about that time of year. I'm just wrapping up. I got about another week of school, and uh, I'll be on to my summer my, my summer transitional period. So Nice. Yeah. Home improvements, a little bit of work at the garage. So that's the way it goes for me. So. <laughs> All right. Well, um, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, hopefully you caught a little bit of a drift of what we have going on tonight. So this evening, uh, our focus isn't going to be on people. It's not going to be on the island. This, this evening, we're going to focus on vehicles. Um, something kind of close to me. I grew up in a vehicle family. I had a, a stepdad who owned and ran a garage and was a drag racer growing up. So cars, yeah. big part, big part of my background. It's what I did for years. I still do it a bit in the summer here and there and uh, tinker around for fun. So, you know, trying to find a different topic, Mike, because to be honest with you, I, I keep going back through and I'm trying to pull up some of the episodes from YouTube, from you and Jay, and I, I don't want to go back and reiterate what we've been doing. So it's uh, it's a little tough because you guys put out some incredible, incredible topics here. At different Thank evenings, you. So. Thank you. Smith and Jones. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, right? <laughs> TV show. <laughs> Smith and Jones, Jones and Smith. Yeah, I do think they're probably the two most popular surnames in like the entire world, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. Very easily could be pen names. Nobody would know, know the better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as a teacher, the names always show up in a book somewhere. Either Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones usually shows up. So. <laughs> All right. Got like a thing going on the back of my head here. It's called driving home with the windows open, Mike, right? <laughs> Don't have enough hair to blow around. That's a bad thing. <laughs> ah, there's still enough there to keep it a good memory. You know what I mean? I slowly kind of have less and less over the years, but uh, <laughs> you still enjoy the sensation, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so I pulled up a couple couple slides and a couple pictures here and, and again our theme tonight is transportation so not just one particular transportation but really anything that shows up in the movie i should say actually movies because i tried to pull a little bit from each movie and um mike i'm definitely going to need your knowledge here because we definitely get into obviously not just the jaws but the jaws too which is which is without a doubt your forte uh with some of this information here as we kind of go through um Found kind of useless knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Mike's facts. That's what Jay said. Speaking of Jay, I put up a little flag in 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 thought of Jay tonight. This is the flag that she always put oh, behind yeah. her when the two of you would broadcast. And I happened to, my wife got got me this for I don't know, maybe it was Christmas. And I have it out in my garage and I'm downstairs in the den. I thought, you know what? I've got to hang the flag. So not only is the flag for the show, this is a Flag for Jay, so it'd be nice to see maybe Jay show up here or someone get the word out to her that we're definitely thinking about her tonight. So. It would be nice. I talk to her sister every now and then, but not a lot of, I guess, I guess no news is good news. Yeah, I guess um, it is. I yeah. think she got pretty scared from social media for a while. But Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can understand it. All right. Uh, yeah, w with without a doubt. I mean, um, you know, without getting too off task. I mean, I've never, I haven't had a whole lot as far as, um, you know, identity theft goes. I know my wife has now twice getting into credit cards and things of that nature. And it is scary because, you know, you realize how easy and how accessible you are. And so I, I can only imagine what she went through. Hmm. Yeah. So. All right. Well, let's get the show on the road here. So the first thing I wanted to dive into tonight, Mike, was was my favorite, and that was the cars. And um, I actually separated the cars from the trucks. Uh, just simple fact that I'm a, I'm a bit of a car guy. And um, I pulled, you know, some important cars, but then I pulled some cars from different scenes because I think it really says a lot about the setting of the movie. Um, I think it says, you know, a lot about the setting of Martha's Vineyard as well, which you know, we talked about the last time was a big character in the movie. And so... 
the obvious one happens to be, you know, Mayor Vaughn's Cadillac up in the right-hand corner there on the ferry, which Mayor Vaughn's Cadillac, it has Mayor Vaughn written all over it. Uh, you know, That's the- big old, you know, big old Cadillac. Um, uh, it's not. Go ahead. So you're I'm a politician. About- if you're a politician in the '70s. I think uh, I think even Boss Hog had a Cadillac on uh, Dukes of Hazard. So, yeah, <laughs> that's the car. That's the car of prestige, without a doubt. And uh, you know, the thing about his Cadillac, unlike Boss Hog's, is is it it doesn't quite stand out. It doesn't make a big statement, which I think that's a bit of a reflection on Mayor Vaughn. You know, he kind of. He wanted things to go well, and he wanted things to go smooth, but he didn't want to be super loud and out there. And, you know, he he always came off to me as um, obviously being the mayor, but not always having that confidence to be up there and, and, you know, making statements. And I'm sure a lot of that was because of the situation. But so I think the, you know, a bit of the muted color and thing kind of is very, very reflective of Mayor Vaughn himself, not reflective of his jackets or his clothing. <laughs> But definitely reflective of him, um, without a doubt. So, um, trivia question for you. Now, I I have a, a pretty good automotive background. I like I said, I grew up around cars. Had a father who had a garage and was in drag racing. And I started out working for dealerships, and I worked for uh, General Motors for quite a while. One of them being Cadillac. And one thing we always knew that. Whatever the names were for whatever, a part, for a color, uh, for a particular body style, when it came to a Cadillac, it couldn't be a red Chevrolet. It couldn't be, uh, you know, a, a uh, Mediterranean blue Buick. It had to be way beyond. Do you know what the actual color, name of the color for that car was, Mike? Any idea? Um, Royal Maroon. <laughs> Terracotta Fire Mist. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. That's like a bonus. That's a bonus trivia question. <laughs> that's someone buys you an extra round trivia question when yeah. they're doing trivia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I, the only reason I even did some digging because I knew it had to be some way out there kind of name, which is, is pretty typical with Cadillac. So, yeah. So, at any rate. Kind of interesting. Um, I tried to pull some shots from a couple of the other cards, and I think it speaks a lot to, again, what we said about, you know, um, about the character of the island. So very memorable shot, or one that really stands out in my mind, is you see the shot of the green car, and they, they do a big close-up on the gentleman driving it. And so when you look at him, you don't think of, you know, the family man going over to the island, taking the family over for like a weekend trip or doing some camping. You know, you're looking at someone who probably does pretty well, probably has a summer home there. Um, and it's very reflective of the car he's driving. He's driving a, what appears to be like a late 60s Jaguar, an XKE. Yeah, very, very fancy, very, very fine vehicle as opposed to uh, most of the other vehicles you see, uh, especially when they're coming off the ferry. Yeah. You can tell yeah. it's he probably he probably parks it on the island. He probably doesn't even bring it over. He's probably got probably got a, a Jaguar in, in New York and he's got one on the island. <laughs> Wouldn't doubt that for one second. Yeah, no doubt about it. And um uh, pretty remarkable car. I'm not not a huge fan of it, but on top of being a very elegant model, it's actually a coupe. Believe it or not, it's actually like a two seater coupe. So there wasn't much of a backseat to those things. So it really kind of Puts him out there and speaks to, you know, some of the people you see in the island. And obviously you've been there and, and you know, um, you, you don't have to travel far to get into to see some of that. You know, I don't know if that'd be old whaling money or summer money, but yeah, it's some pretty impressive uh, vehicles. And in fact, like you said, I my times that I've been there, I've seen a lot of summer vehicles and the summer vehicles are old Land Rovers, uh, you know, Mercedes SUVs and stuff. So it's kind of interesting. So. Compared I to me driving, I think that's a lot of what they rent. I think I think all they rent is like uh, convertibles and and really high end F- SU- uh, SUVs at the at the rental car places. Yeah, a um, lot of SUVs, a lot of Jeeps. Yeah, I think too. Uh, Mini Coopers, you know, stuff of that that matter. Yeah, yeah, with 
without a doubt. Um, and uh, so, you know what? Let me check here for some. So the other thing is, is, is you know, I think what we what you hit on was um, bottom picture in the middle there was a lot of your. So you got you got your pickup truck with your caps, you know, campers all stuffed, packed and ready for a trip. You got a lot of station wagons, old Chevy Malibu wagons, Chevy Impala wagons in the back. Uh, you know, big old, uh, looks like a Dodge A100 delivery truck. So a lot of what goes on on the island. And as you know, you know, when you're there, uh, a lot of what you see on that island, you know, it's a lot of local business catering to the people that are there. So it makes sense that you see a lot of business trucks there. And, and, Definitely. Uh, family. Yeah. Definitely. And this, this shot is indicative of Edgar town from May to October. I mean, it's just a, a constant steady stream of cars. Yeah. Without a doubt. Hey, we got someone chiming in. Who we got? Good evening, Mike and Nate. I'm going to assume that's our, our good friend, Vic. That's Vic. Mikey's here. Connor, hello. Very good. We got yeah, uh, what, what about Mustang convertible? Yeah, I, yeah, I the, saw one last time I was there. Bright yellow. Yes. I believe there's a blue Mustang, about a 72 convertible, that's in the shot in Edgartown, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I did take a shot, and actually, I think it was in the same shot. All the way on the right there, you see a, that's a little white Volvo. And what most people think of Volvos, they think of like you know, station wagons and stuff like that. That's actually a Volvo sports car. Um, Volvo made a handful of sports cars, little two-seaters back in the 60s. And again, I think it's very like vindicative of, you know, of what you and I have been talking about here. But yeah, definitely saw the Mustang convertible there, too. So similar shot. Yeah, cool. So. Just kind of, I think, a little statement about the movie and about some people, and then, and uh, also the island itself. So we will uh, move on here. So I had to get into trucks. I'm a pretty big truck guy. I didn't grow up a truck guy. I grew up a muscle car guy. I don't know what's your what's your take on cars. Do you have any particular type of car you like, Mike? Uh, I drive Hondas. Okay. Yeah. I did okay. have, yeah. and uh, when I was uh, in the service. Uh, in Kansas, I, I had a uh, 67 GTO. Nice. I, I, I miss it. Uh, before I went home on vacation, somebody ran a stop sign and hit me. Oh. And I put it in the shop. And while I was down in Florida on vacation, the shop burned down and my car went with it. Um, uh, it was beautiful. Uh, I, You're I, kidding I, me, Mike. I cried. I love that car. But um, <laughs> I, had a, I had a big... Uh, old Delta 88 in high school, a big white car that we called Bruce. And, um, uh, but a friend of mine drove a Honda, uh, one of the first little Honda Civics, I'm guessing. And um, since 82, every car I've, I've had is a Honda. I just, I like them. So. Great little cars. Um, yeah, I messed around with a couple of those over the years. My wife's been driving Toyotas. Fabulous little car. The old Hondas, I mean, just like the newer Hondas run. The only thing with the older Hondas, you had to keep them from rusting. Other than that, they were great cars. Fabulous cars. Yeah. But your, your GTO burning down after getting hit, like, I, oh, my uh, gosh. I wept. It was <laughs> beautiful. It was like, I, it probably had a fancy color. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't red, but it wasn't purple. It was just mm -hmm. that kind of glitter. Oh, my God. It was, oh, uh, wow. Wow. I've owned a bunch of old cars. Never had a goat. Um, had Monte Carlos. Had a Mercury Cyclone for a while. Chevelle. Never had a goat though. Always wanted a goat. Man, very cool. Uh, um, so hitting on trucks here. I I become a big pickup truck guy. I've been driving pickup trucks for the last twenty five years. I drove like S tens and stuff like that for a long time. I'm driving Silverados for probably the last fifteen years. Man, and uh, you know. Brody's pickup truck always, always stood up. I shouldn't say pickup because it's not. It's actually a Chevy Blazer, um, is what it was. And um, real common to the time period, your early to mid seventies Blazers, they had a fiberglass top, and you would you would unbolt them to take them off. And the only reason I know is because I had a buddy in high school that had one, um, and they had they had a factory roll bar so that you could actually do that. And they only did that for so many years. And then they did away with it. In fact, uh, it got to the point where it's very hard to find a two door Chevy blazer, let alone, um, you know, a two door, you know, hard top removable blazer. That was a big thing back in the seventies. Um, and, uh, 
I don't know. You know, I didn't think of it much at the time because I grew up around cars. I was like, oh, it's another Chevy Blazer. But nowadays, coming across them is virtually next to impossible. No. Like, phone heavy uh, teeth. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you do come across them, they're going for a lot of money. I'm, I don't know if you've seen it, but the last two times I was on the island, there is one. There is a replica. Yeah. I think it's a replica running around. I see it in Oak Plus all the time, usually down by by the park, by Ocean Park or whatever. Um. And I want to say there's a guy in, in Rhode Island that has a um, a hot sauce company, and he has built a replica of it. And it's like Shark's Hot Sauce or something to that extent. He has a replica of the truck as well. Nice. Yeah, very cool stuff. And I did throw the uh, the truck from Jaws 2. Jaws 2 um, in there, yeah. Yeah, different color. And that, that one was a GMC. That wasn't Chevy. So I don't know if that... Speaks to him doing a little a, bit better, second movie. They probably got a licensing, uh, not a licensing, but they probably got uh, uh, free. Yeah, you know, we, we could use this truck. We will put it in the movie if we can get it for free. Yeah, <laughs> whereas they probably just bought an old uh, an old Blazer for, for Jaws, but Jaws too, they could pretty much put anything they wanted on it, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, being a truck guy, I had to throw pictures of Quint's truck in there, even though unfortunately it never made it off the, you know, off the cutting room floor to the movie. Um, very cool old truck, just an old, I'd say 63, 64 um, Chevy uh, pickup truck that had a work box on it. You know, it had in typical Quint fashion, you know, very, very basic, you know, very plain, you know, paint, probably painted his own name and painted the own shark on the side of it. <laughs> So, good stuff. Hey, we're getting some more comments in here. We got Ford F-150 truck rule. Yeah. Uh, I used to drive one at work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a fan of pickup trucks in general. My older brother always drove GMC trucks. Yeah, I had one for quite a while. Love mine. Uh, loved that thing and sold it one day. And, yeah, you know, sometimes I miss it, sometimes not so much. Hondas are too expensive. Eh, take care of them, they're not. Every every Honda I've traded in has had at least two hundred thousand miles on it. And I was going to say, still, still running like a top. So yeah, we are. My wife and I are in the market for a car for her right now because she has a Toyota Corolla Sport, um, and it's got over one hundred and eighty on it. And uh, we're shopping for similar cars now. And the price jump between when I bought that in 07 and what we're looking at now, everything's pretty expensive right now. Mm-hmm. So, without a doubt. 74, Quinn's vehicle looks like 1940. <laughs> it does. It's, it's early 60s. Yeah, it was uh, pretty common. The, the Chevy had the trademark hood. We used to call the eyebrows. The turn signals were actually mounted in the top of the hood, believe it or not. Huh. Um, and they were separate from the headlights, which were in the grill. That's how you can tell them apart. So, all right. Uh, and I wanted to throw this up real quick, just because I found this interesting. So I was doing I was doing some research on Chief Brody's truck. You know, um, I tend to think that it was kind of rare that it had the, the roll bar with the lights. And really, the only thing added onto the truck outside of, you know, the Amity um, Police Department on the side of the truck was the lights on the roll bar. The roll bar, including the color pattern of the truck, was a factory option. What you're looking at is the actual 1974 brochure page. So that picture that you see of that blazer are sitting on the beach. That's Chief Brody's blazer. Huh. I thought that was kind of cool. Very. Yeah. So what do we got? My favorite vehicle is the Lexus series of cars. Yeah, Lexus. That would be your your high end Toyotas with the Lexus. Yeah, very high end. Yeah. Stick with cool. Hondas. Yeah, yeah. Hondas and Acuras, right? <laughs> Got some boats. Yeah, I thought we'd move on to boats here. So, um, Mike, the only thing I know about uh, Mr. Gardner's boat was the name was Flicka. So I figured you could probably fill us in a bit on the, on the Flicka boat, right? Uh, basically, just a, your regular old run-of-the-mill fishing boat that you find by the hundreds uh, in, on Martha's Vineyard. Um, basically, just enough room for you to drive and someone in the back. 
Uh, you see, like similar to the one below it, that's basically your your standard fishing boat. You probably rent you probably rent a boat like that today up on, on the island if you want to go out boating. Yeah, I would assume. And walking around there, you still see some of those. Those are the old old wooden boats, mm -hmm. um, which I would imagine most days it's either going to be fiberglass or oh, aluminum. Yeah. 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 Whatever. Yeah, absolutely. We got whatever happened to his boat. Well, I do know um, through my research, if you look at the picture, guys, up on the right-hand side, that is actually the Flicka. That is the boat that Ben Gardner used in the Jaws movie. Years later, it was moved to the Jaws attraction, I, I want to say in Florida. It was repainted. So there you see it's white and red rather than the, I guess it was blue and red in the movie. Um, and I, the more pictures I found of it, the more I realized it was just basically sat and, and rotted, same as the orca did. So I would assume it probably saw the same fate as the orca. I think I it was there until... You know, you know, in, the, in the Jaws 2 book, um, I have a friend, uh, Chris Lord, out in uh, California. Uh, he did a lot of uh, deliveries at Universal at the studio. And he came across uh, Tina's Joy. He came across Tina and Eddie's boat from Jaws 2. And he took pictures of it. The pictures are, are in the book. And you can see where the paint was, and, and you can see where the part was, was broken off, where Eddie broke it off. They, they just took this stuff and just back to the studio and, and dumped it. Um, I, mean, I mean, nowadays, you know, with the popularity of films and memorabilia and everything else, probably nothing leaves the set without, uh, you know, some kind of destin destination. But, yeah, they just dumped it, dumped it on the back lot. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, now we have enough foresight to realize that, I guess, number one, all these things are profitable. But back then, it just really wasn't a thing, I would assume. So, yeah. Yeah. Bloody hell, Victor. 100% agree <laughs> on that. Bloody hell. Bloody hell on the Flicka, uh, on Orca. The shark, I would assume, like the sharks, same thing. Back line just rotted away to nothing. Which one? The sharks themselves. Bruce, those guys. Um, the uh, Yeah, the sharks went back. Um, the last one, um, and the other day I, I posted a memory from 12 years ago. No, I'm trying to think 10 years ago, 10 years ago, yesterday I was in LA and I went out, I drove about 40 miles out of town to the junkyard that had uh, Bruce in it. And I posted a picture of junkyard Bruce and, um, now it sits, uh, it was the last, Last remaining shark made from the original mold. And now it's in the Academy Museum, Great Nicotero. Uh, with Joel's uh, guidance, they restored it back to its original luster, I guess if that's the word. And now it's it hangs at the Academy Museum when you walk in. But, you know, they just dumped it. And I think, I want to say it was the Jaws, the Jaws 2 shark at Universal in, in Orlando. Um, I went twice, and both times the ride was broken. Um, but the pictures I've seen uh, or the video I've seen, people go on the trip, uh, the shark catches on fire, and when it pops up, it's got the scars on it. So I, I wonder if that's I wonder if that's the Jaws 2 shark they just they saved and, and sent out to Universal or sent out to Orlando when they opened up the park. Wow. But, um it was that was it was hanging in the junkyard. Am I right? Salvage yard? Yeah, it was up in a tree. It was up in a tree. Thank goodness somebody decided to hold on to that guy. Yeah, and they they uh, the junkyard eventually finally closed. I think that's why they sold it because they they turned down lots of money, lots of offers for it in the past. But you know, it was like a tourist attraction because um, you had to pay. It was like. Um, it was like two bucks, I think, for, for me to go in because they were like, what are you looking for? I said, I'm not looking for any car parts or anything because I think they have like a $10 fee if you're going to go in and look for, you know, carburetors or whatever. I said, no, I'm, I'm just here to see a shark. So it was two bucks and I walked in and they and they watched me to make sure I wasn't going to sneak off and pull off a hubcap from somewhere. But yeah, I took a couple of pictures and left, but it was just nice to, to see it. But yeah, it was up in a palm tree. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Got a remark here from somebody. Uh, Jaws Revenge Shark was stuck in the back lot in Universal Studios. 
I think I've seen pictures of that. And if I remember, he was looking less like uh, Jaws or Bruce. And he was looking more like Gums because he was so rotted. <laughs> I think I'd been torn out. Probably people taking them for souvenirs, and he just did not look good. I can only imagine if there's anything left now, what possibly would be. I think I have. Excuse me for a moment. Sure. Uh. Oh, that was Victor, by the way, comment. Oh, I think this is the Jaws the Revenge Shark. Um. That's me at Universal. I'm smiling because I haven't been told yet that the ride is broken. <laughs> I think that was the Jaws Revenge Shark that they had out in front of the little Amity area. Well, at least you could smile with the shark because when I was there, um, I had to stand and look at the Harry Potter exhibit, Mike, while uh, standing next to the lake. So you were smiling. I, I was not. <laughs> well. Ten minutes later, I was sad. Every picture that day after that, you know, here's Mike on ET ride. Sad face. Yeah. <laughs> sad face. It was like vacation. My son and I got there. We ran, ran to Amityville, and John Candy was like, "Sorry, folks, ride's broken. Shark outside. Should have told you." Yeah, I was. That was uh, pretty, yeah, I, pretty sad. I got to say, uh, I spent my entire time just trying to find some Jaws memorabilia of some sort, just some connection while we were there. I, I couldn't find a shirt. I couldn't find a water bottle. I couldn't find any. I went in every store you could possibly think of at the time. So I, it looks like it's made a comeback. I mean, it's more relevant, so you're seeing it more now. So, so. all right, moving on. So what we have, Spielberg said the Orca boat was ripped to pieces without him knowing. Um, yeah, and that's that's next slide. I, you know, I, you can't not talk about the orca here. Um, and it, it was it was it was torn up and and put up. But to be honest with you, if you look at pictures of it sitting there, I mean, you could number one, you could see how low it was sitting in the water, so it had to be taken on water. Number two, you could literally see the planks rotted, the lap blade. I'm sure it got to the point where it was dangerous to even walk on the boat. Um, but I don't I don't know if you guys know this or not, Mike. You probably do, but. After the movie was was done, the boat was sold to, I believe it was one of the people who worked on the boat, actually bought the boat, did a little bit of refurbishing, and the boat spent time out in the ocean. I want to say it spent time in the Mediterranean. I mean, it went on some really cool trips until it was bought back. Um, yeah, until it was bought back. In fact, you can actually look and find some pictures. Now, they kept the boat pretty, pretty much close to what it was, um, but it, it actually went and did quite a bit of sailing around the world and I'm, I'm sure I probably could water for next to nothing. It was, it was like he and another person and like, look at these, like your two girlfriends and two wives. You do some searching and you can find it, um, find pictures of it and a little bit of backstory on it. It was one of the guys that worked oh, on, that's on the cool. Orca. Pretty cool. That is cool. There Very was, cool. um, I remember a TV show murder. She wrote, uh, Cabot Cove every now and then Angela Lansbury would go down by the water. In the establishing shot, you can see the orca. The orca was always docked because it was filmed at Universal. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, I just don't think they saw the value in trying to keep it up. But, yeah, you, you see Victor's reaction. Not real happy. No. <laughs> um, and uh, I did try and throw a shot in there, um, not only of the, the orca we know it, but obviously as what Orca started out as, which was a lobster trawler. And um, you ever spend time up, up in New England, you see a lot of boats that look very similar to what you see uh, going on there. You know, big, big uh, rear of the boat, you know, plenty of place to work, kind of sat a little bit lower in the water in the back. I guess it had to do with the working area, pulling up the, the, the traps and dropping them. And, uh, um, and um, you know, what it actually looked like. And the name was the Warlock, I believe, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and you can even see, I mean, you, there's no doubt it's the original boat. I do know they tore the entire top off the bigger, the bigger windows in on account of shooting and stuff like that. But really, it does stay pretty true to what you see the original, what the original pictures were of the boat. So, and the bottom right hand picture, that was the 
that was the Orca too. That was the, the one that would they would sink and bring back up and had the barrels yes, underneath that, it. That, and yeah. Lynn Murphy kept that, and he that's actually a good picture of it because now it's nothing but a, a few sheets of uh, fiberglass. Because he had it out, he had it out on a, on a sandbar in a cove, and people were trespassing and taking pictures of it and taking pieces off of it. So finally, he took it back to his to his barn. Yeah, he did. And um, I know I tried looking long and hard every time I go there to see at least remnants of the steel framing underneath it. And you could see some things over there because it's right across from an empty there. Yeah, I would have no idea if that was part of it or not. Yeah. I know there was a I know there was a Yahoo about a year ago who had gone over there and taken some old rusty steel parts off a piece of framing. You can see there was trying to sell them on eBay for like 100 bucks for a piece of rust. And um, hmm. I know he wasn't getting very far with it. So, uh. there's always people there's a guy that sold oh um, every now and then it pops up on ebay he's got like a a squeeze like a squeeze ketchup bottle that he says is is the blood the blood used in jaws and my uncle was a makeup man and this is the blood and i'm thinking that, that, that was caro syrup and food color and that stuff would have hardened would have hardened 40 years ago but you know but people buy stuff the i used to uh, when Jay Gove had um, JawsMovie.com, um, I, I wrote a thing that was like the first thing you saw when he went to the site um, to be be aware of what you buy. Um, uh, I remember once on eBay, uh, some kid ended up buying a Jaws Revenge poster signed by Robert Shaw and um, paying $187 for it. Oh. And uh, back then, Back then, you could see who the high bidder was, because um, I would I would often bid on stuff. Uh, Jim Beller and I, and it'd either be high bidder be me or Jimmy Jaws. Um, but now they've taken that away. But I even sent the guy an email and said, "Hey, Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw died nine years before this movie came out. He didn't sign it." Um, and I always tell people a, a certificate of authenticity is. Just the guy selling it to you saying, yeah, as far as I know, it's real. Um, but, yeah. So beware. Get a picture. Get a picture of somebody signing it. I, I know my brother is very much a baseball person and baseball um, uh, collector of things. And I know he is so overly skeptical. You see signed balls, signed cards at 90. I mean, what he told me, I think 90% of them, you just can't count on them being real or not. doesn't matter yeah. what comes. Yeah, all my baseball autographs I got in person. Yeah, well, that 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 yeah, that you really can't dispute. So, all right, so I'm saying, how long was the orca? Um, that's kind of a loaded question, and it, the only reason I say that is because I do know. So, so the boat itself, I want to say the actual boat. If you're measuring pulp, it's probably somewhere around 30 feet, give or take. But having the pulpit on the front, that counts as the length of the boat. I would imagine that pulpit probably came in around what do you think, like 10 feet or so. Eight ten foot, yeah, because it's it was yeah. out quite it was out quite a ways. Yeah, it really was. So you're you're probably talking neighborhood of like forty feet, give or take, there overall. Um, it was a good sized vessel, without a doubt. And I would imagine probably not uncommon for that type of a boat because you need a lot of working space, uh, not only to haul gear, you know, like when they're going out to haul the traps out, put them in the water, but then to reload and you know, I would assume cleaning stations and all those things. I think. I, th I know the boat, they bought it in Massachusetts. I think it originally it either came from I don't know, it was like Nova Scotia, like part of Canada, or maybe Maine. I'm not sure. But it was it was definitely, you know, a boat that was built up there that is no longer being being built. That much I do know. So all right, so and I couldn't go without talking a little bit about some of the boats pertaining to Hooper. Um, <laughs> uh because there's always a couple of arguments. And what was funny, Mike, was I found a lot of people who were claiming that they found um, Hooper's beautiful white boat. Not the boat that he arrives on or the, the, the picture of you with fascinating rhythm that he was right. going on, but that big, beautiful cabin cruiser um, that he had. I actually found in a boating forum, guys were swearing, and I want to say it was Florida, somewhere down south, that they had... Um, pictures of the actual boat which they believe what they were told was was the actual boat and so i did a little bit of research on that 
Um, and the actual boat was a, let me double check, make sure I got my information right here. A 1973 28-foot pacemaker cabin cruiser. Um, and what I didn't realize was pacemaker is a company that was responsible. That was one of their smaller boats. They really got into like the mini yacht market. Um, and there's a couple of that exact era still floating around, still for big chunks of money, like $30,000. I saw one for sale in California that had recently sold. Mm. Um, but must have been pretty big money. It had twin V8 Chrysler engines in it. So, I mean, you're not talking about, you know, uh, you know New Yorker with probably a four-cylinder Ford or a diesel or something in it. I mean, you're talking, everyone's got some money, a bit of a party boat, even though his wasn't set up for that. So. Huh. And the name of it being the Sea Serpent, which I wasn't aware of. I don't know if you knew that or not, Mike. I did not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually, um, the center picture is a picture of the one I was telling you about that recently sold out in San Diego. Uh, you can definitely see the likeness there, you know, minus the underwater cameras for an app. <laughs> as far as we know, can't tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I put the picture of you in there with fascinating rhythm, and that was the boat that he was patrolling on. I'm assuming that was the boat maybe he pulled up to when he first met Ben Gardner when he came in Edgar Town. Yeah, I, I, like I'm that? thinking like a, a lot of people uh, they go to the vineyard, they have the big boat, and then they have the little boat to go to the dock. Um, so I'm thinking that fascinating rhythm, we, he probably had it uh, tied behind the sea serpent, and he takes that into the dock. Um, it was his you know, patrol boat and everything else. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. And um, I, uh, I I was kind of curious, and I did a little bit of research just because of how many hard facts you come across in the movie. And if you if you look at the, the boat underneath the fascinating rhythm, I know it's a small picture, but believe it or not, that is the Swiss research vessel called the Aurora. Ah. which happens to be a, a research vessel that people rent to go out and do months of research um, out in the ocean at sea. And it has been commissioned, as far as I know, for well over 40 years. So would that be where this came from? I have no idea. But it came up right away. I didn't have to do a lot of digging. Huh. Well, I'm sure Carl did some research when he wrote it, so... Yeah. He probably went over the probably went over the ocean ocean oceanographic institute and said, "Hey, if we're going to do this, how will we do this?" So, yeah, yeah I, w- I would assume. I would assume. And you know, there's many other facts that come out right around you know, that time talking about you know who they were going to call for you know help with the media and stuff. I mean, a lot of it was was there was some realism going there. So it wouldn't be surprised. I can't verify it, but it would be surprised. But if anyone's interested. Go look it up. There's an entire website dedicated towards what it's done, the research that the, you know the people do on it, and the fact that you can go rent it. I think we're currently it's being rented through a college over there right now for ocean organic research. So pretty cool stuff. Kind of funny what you stumble across when you're digging for things. So. Right. And now we move into some more boats. Boats Jones here in two. Jaws 2. Jaws 2. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, Outside of a catamaran and an inflatable, Mike, I know very little about the boats in Jaws too. Yeah. Um, I even went. I even went back and rewatched one of the um, one of the Jaws live episodes when you had. I, it kills me. I can never remember names. The gentleman who was in Jaws two, also in Jaws one, and wore the glasses. Oh, Tom. Uh, Tom Dunlop. Tom Dunlop from the island. I, I actually went back and watched that episode to kind of help me out with, you know, with, with some of the boating. And what was interesting is how he talked about how some of the boats were so much faster than the other boats. And so it was it was such a pain to try and get these guys to kind of work together and keep the boats in the scene. So what, what can you tell us about some of the boats there, Mike? Uh, let's see. Uh, top left, uh, Keith Gordon. Um Presumably, reading a copy of Jaws, I don't know if that's true or not. I've seen that as trivia. I've never looked close enough to see in his little uh, uh, almost like inner two boat. Uh, top right is Tina's Joy, um, which, as uh, we said earlier, was is still on the Universal lot. 
Um, down below is uh, uh, the speedboat that uh, Christine, Fr uh, Christine Freeman got towed behind that Jean Coulter drove. And it kind of looks like, you know, from this angle, it's like, it looks like Ben Gardner's boat. But that's pretty much the, the, the style of the boats that, that were readily available on, on the ocean and down in Florida. Um, on the left, uh, lower left, is that the lobster boat? That is the lobster boat. Still, lobster boat. still running. Still running and still in existence to this day. Yeah, you can still do tours on it. Actually, it's painted right on the side. Uh, yeah. like Aquanon, I believe, was the name. Yes, yeah. and you can. Uh, it's 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 docked. It's docked in uh, in Destin, and you can. Um, it's by Captain Day's Captain Day's Restaurant, uh, where they built the extra dock onto the dock that they run down when they bring the boats in. Um, yeah, as as seen in Jaws too. And then in the middle there, you just got the, the various catamarans. And what I liked about Tom Dunlop is um, he was really hired because he knew these boats and he had a certain boat and uh, he could teach, you know, teach these people, you know, how to maneuver them and stuff. Cause you really at the, if you don't know what you're doing, you're just at the, at, at the whim, at the whim of, of mother nature. Uh, the wind's going to one way. You want to go the other. You have to know how to adjust the sail and everything else. Um, I've, I don't have not boated that much, but I've always had a motor on mine, so I wouldn't know how to, uh, how to begin to, to, uh, raise a sail and head into the, head into the wind or out of the wind or anything else. Now I, I've owned like aluminum bass boats and, uh, right now I have, you know, kayaks and, uh, I would have no clue. The only kind of one I can make is I've seen some catamarans and it's amazing how little is there. I mean, those things are, you, you talk about being, it reminds me of like a high end road bike, very spelt, very, very uh, lightweight, very thin, as little material as possible just to make those things alive. Built for speed. Built for Holy. speed. But not much else. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yes. And, you know, and looking at those things, uh, I mean, they're running like carbon fiber masts. I mean, they got to be running, you know, I can only imagine what it costs to, to repair one of those guys. But, you know, if, if, if that's your passion, you know, it's all an entertainment fee. So, yeah. Bruce, I can smash all of them with ease, without a doubt. After seeing a oh, catamaran yeah. in person, I don't know if I'd get on that thing and go out in the ocean, to be honest with you. Maybe the local lake, but not not out in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What do we have coming next year? So, had to include some of the fairies, without a doubt, because the fairies are a big part of the movie. Oh yeah, um, you know, and as you you know, Mike, fairies are a big part of the island. In fact, that's the only way you're going to get there unless you're going to fly in. Um, uh, we've always taken the ferries from Woods Hole. I do know that there's smaller ferries and fast ferries, uh, Rhode Island, even as far south as like New York. But if you're going to go and take a vehicle, it's going to be out of Woods Hole. Um, yeah. And I've taken a vehicle every time I went. And the last time we went, we weren't going to take a vehicle. I mean, I, especially on the island, I cycle everywhere. I mean, there's bike paths to go every place you can imagine. Uh, but we went the last time for two weeks. And we had myself, uh, my family, some brought up a friend and my in-laws. So we figured we needed a vehicle. Uh, so we took mine over and kind of used, you know, to cart people around. Of course, trying to find parking can be an issue. But we were there in June, so it wasn't too bad. But. So if you guys aren't familiar, um, your bottom two pictures there, those are the those are the big ferries that you take. And I, if I had to guess, I would say each one of those big ferries would probably hold somewhere around 100 cars, maybe a little more. Mike, I don't know if that sounds right to you. It's about right because it's you got like one side, one side. I'm trying to think because that sounds about right. And they have to you got to make reservations. You got to tell how much your car ways or length. what kind of car the length because yeah. they they load you by the length it's it's all it's i mean it's it's well thought out it's it's well calculated how to get over there but um yeah then you just go up on top and and enjoy the, enjoy the ocean yeah i i do know if you're going to go over during the season if you want to um at particular dates um getting tickets can be a rush they open uh steamship authority is the name of the company that runs them and um, for the times that we've gone over there, uh, you, you pretty much have to, to try and coordinate 
booking where you're staying and your, your ferry ticket can be a little tricky. And so they open up every year. It's usually like January 14th, January 17th, somewhere around there. And booking goes live at like five o'clock in the morning. And I have three times been sitting at 430 because I don't sleep much anyway with my credit card and my laptop, Steamship Authority website waiting to go live. And you're in queue and you're like number 527 waiting to get, <laughs> waiting no. to get your tickets for the fair. No. So it's, um, they're high in demand. If, if you're walking on, going as a walk on or like you know, taking a bike. Yeah. As far as I know, you can pretty much get on at any time. Maybe uh, if we see Donna here, maybe she'll chime in and kind of let us know. But if you're taking a car, it's a little bit of a different story. So, yeah. But, um, and they have fast ferries, too, that I guess do some pretty good time from, like, Hyannis and those places. Like, if you go down to um, Oak Bluffs down at the, the, uh, the harbor there, you always see a lot of them, them there, especially like people doing day trips and stuff. Did you guys drive from Boston Airport to Martha's Vineyard? We did uh, last September of 21, um, our flight was um, delayed and um, they sent us to Washington, D.C. Then they sent us to New York. Then we went to Boston. Um, we were supposed to be on the five o'clock ferry and we didn't land in Boston until seven o'clock. And my wife, God bless her, in a driving rainstorm. Um, we made it to Woods Hall uh, at 9.35, and the last ferry was 9.45, and, you know, I was almost in tears I was because we had so much planned, and, you know, we had this, we had this, and they said, yeah, come on, they had room for us. But, um, yeah, you would not love to fly in. Um, apparently now the uh, major airlines go, uh, not with big jets, but with sm- with – smaller planes um yeah. right now what they have is it's called cape air which everyone calls cape scare because it's basically uh they seat you by your weight and it's like you take it's like the pilot and seven people and it's just a horrible the whole time over and um uh the first time uh the first time i went i took it over it was fine uh, the second year, my wife and my son and I went, and we got separated. And um, my son and I, um, I'm sorry, the first time we didn't fly, we took the ferry. And then the second time we flew over, and my wife hates to fly anyway, and that flight was just going over. I knew she would be a wreck when she got off the plane, and she was. Um, but uh, I've had the pilot that goes, you know, this is the same route that John F. Kennedy Jr. took the day he died. Oh, I was like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, we, you, we take the ferry. We, we don't do Cape Scare anymore. <laughs> I have driven in, and, and uh, you know, for us, it's like a seven, eight-hour drive um, where I'm coming from. The wild card is New York uh, when you're mm-hmm. going through New York City. And I've since learned, because I got stuck hitting New York City at the wrong time going across George Washington. But there are other other ways to get through New York. Um, I've kind of played at trying to fly in, but to be honest with you, when you look at flying from where I am up to Boston and then you know getting out to the vineyard and then getting you know it time wise, number one, I'm not saving anything, and it looks like money wise, I'm not really saving a whole lot either. So, no. but take the ferry. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt, if you can, do it. Yeah, we got here. What an idiot! Yeah. I can't believe they told you that that's, yeah. that's how Kennedy died or you're on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All you got to do is start playing like Buddy Holly, Buddy Holly music over the radio, too. <laughs> uh, you like Buddy Holly? Oh, <laughs> that is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, and we definitely have the Chappie Ferry, uh, Chappie Ferry on there, which, you know, really showcases itself early on in the movie. And, um, uh, the distance the Chappie Ferry covers is something like, I don't know, it's like 500 feet. Very small. Yeah, it's just vo- yeah. Vo- yeah. Very small, very quick. And uh, only holds a couple cars. Uh, and each side, you have seats along the side you can sit on. I've gone over a couple times. I'll go over on my bike and go explore Chappie, Chappie Aquatic. And, uh, yeah, cool little thing. And supposedly, uh, Kennedy, because the ferry wasn't running when he, you know, uh, put the car in the drink, over the bridge on Chappie, 
supposedly <laughs> swam across that channel. Supposedly. Now they think oh, possibly really? possibly his buddies rode him over in a boat, but it's never been verified. I I wouldn't be too big on swimming across there. You got some current coming through there. But well, I was told by someone that uh, may or may not have written books on the Chappie Ferry and was very, very good friends with the gentleman that ran it, that um, when Ted Kennedy supposedly said, oh, I got there and the, the, they had gone home for the night, he mm -hmm. hadn't gone home. The ferry was still there. So um, that's just a little little more to, to the mystery of Chappaquiddick. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the Kennedys were swimmers, but that's that's – that's well, hell, uh, dicey. Especially at night. Yeah. And a, a plug in for you guys at home. If you haven't seen the movie Chappaquiddick came out a handful of years ago, check it out. It's really good and it really dives into that. Um, and, and there are definitely some shots there from Martha's Vineyard and Chappie. And then unfortunately there's some shots of Edgar Town Hall and things that are like from like now filmed in like Georgia or something like that. But yeah. very good film if you have a chance to See it. I definitely and they, they talk a lot about the medical examiner, Dr. Nevin. Dr. So, Nevin, that's right. Yes. So Doc Nevin from Jaws is is mentioned a lot in Chappaquiddick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I felt like I had to dive a little bit into aviation of some sort because I the whole time I'm trying to put this together, Mike, I'm thinking planes, trains, and automobiles. That's all I could think about. <laughs> was that was that movie? And so I wanted to get in a little bit, too, because there was obvious uh, we had some planes and we definitely had some choppers. And Jaws 1, uh, you know, when the beaches are being patrolled right before the, you know, the two kids come in with the fake fin, you see this chopper go up and down in like two or three scenes. And so I decided to dive in a little bit and I started doing some research. And this particular chopper was the Enstrom F-28. And apparently there's still a modern version of this same chopper out being used today and this was a little bit more of a luxurious chopper in other words it wasn't like didn't look like a steel erector set with a with a bubble on it um that's been used for many different applications what i thought was really interesting uh this particular model which was used up through 75 had a nickname the f-28's nickname was the shark ah. that's it was nicknamed the shark in the aviation world so right away i'm going so this is that why they used it in the movie? Was it a coincidence? But that's the nickname of the chopper. Outside of that, I know nothing about it. I just thought that was coincidence enough that I at least wanted to kind of acknowledge it. It's kismet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, we got this guy, Mike. Um, so I'll let you fill us in on this guy because I know very little about him. I, I, I did find a little bit about the chopper, but not much about him other than the fact that he's been in a couple of movies. That is Captain Jerry Baxter, who currently lives on Martha's Vineyard. <clears throat> uh, he was a helicopter pilot. Um, they were looking for someone with a, with a helicopter to use in the film. He supplied his. He helped them build the mock-ups. And he was, um, um, he was Jacques Cousteau's helicopter pilot on the Calypso. Oh, you're kidding. Uh, I didn't know for that. For two years, yes. Um, and um, he still has the beard. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, uh, he built this helicopter. He, he, uh, it's a uh, little trivia for those of you who might not know. Uh, his voice was dubbed by Howard Hessman. Um, so next time you watch Jaws 2 and he says, throw me a line, you're going to say, that's Howard Hessman. Because it is Howard Hessman. Howard um, Hessman of, what is it, WKRP? And WKRP and, and um, uh, head of the class and uh, Billy Jack. He was he was a member of the committee. Uh, he and Carl Gottlieb were part of the committee, the improv group in the 60s. Oh, okay. And um, wow. uh, Carl's wife at the time, Allison, uh, had uh, Howard come in and do the, do the, the dubbing. Hmm. So, um, yeah. But basically, it was a working helicopter, and it was Captain Baxter's helicopter, and uh, he got got a little screen time. Nice. And he's a resident on the vineyard. That I, that I was totally yeah, unaware of. Uh, he and his um, longtime uh, uh, companion, uh, Virginia, uh, moved there, I think, two years ago. Um, oh, wow. 
and his son Mike, Mike Baxter, is on uh, Facebook. Um, he likes to talk to fans. If you want to go to my Facebook page and just look for Mike Baxter and uh, drop a line. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. A military background, I'm assuming. Yes. Correct? Yes. Wow. And still, he's going to be up there in age then because he wasn't quite that young when he shot, when that was shot. He was too. He's, I want to say, early 80s, maybe. I saw him in. 2018, I think he came to the book signing at the History Museum, and um, he also makes uh, wooden wooden toys uh, for kids. And I actually got a, he gave me a couple uh, toys that he made for my grandkids. But um, very nice man, yeah, Jerry Baxter. I did, I did come across one one fact. I haven't seen it verified, but it did come up on a seemed to be a pretty reputable site, and it said that. So in the um, the scene that was cut from the movie, which is him being attacked underwater by Brucette, that when he was being attacked, the sound that you hear of him screaming was the same sound that was in Jaws during the underwater Hooper cage. Attack. Yeah, the yes. and the same yes. noise that Hooper makes when Ben Gardner's head pops out. Yeah, I think it's like a oh, universal, interesting. I think it's like a universal. Uh, uh, not Universal Studios, but a Universal in film, like underwater scream, just like mm -hmm. they have what they call the Wilhelm scream. Yes. Uh, in film or, you know, oh, out in the background. I think that's basically just the underwater. So. <laughs> we got, my man got Vic here. Invite him to Jaws 50. You know what? Oh, he would one. be a pretty good. He he just, would, that would be a good one. He could just walk down the street. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a, a pretty interesting uh, person to have sitting on there. Yes, yes. Well, we're slowly kind of winding down here. Um, but I had to bring up Vic's favorite, and I had to try and get dig a little bit of information on at least one airplane since we're talking about some helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vic, this this one is all for you, buddy. So, try it here. Uh and I wanted to pull up a little bit of Vic's laughing at us there. I wanted to pull a little bit of the, the plane um, that was used uh, for Jaws of Revenge. And as you, know, as you guys know, the plane was attacked after they put it in the water, I guess, to try and save the boat. Uh, and the plane was a Cessna, I guess, pretty common, uh, like four-seat plane or six-seat plane that you would see for small, like, like private use. Um and the picture on the right was something that I stumbled across when I was trying to do a little research on it. And that is, you can still go down to Nassau and you can go dive. The plane is still there, laying on the bottom of the ocean. And that yeah. is a picture of it. So if you're a diver and you're a Jaws of Revenge nut, I don't know if the two ever cross or not, but <laughs> you can actually go dive and check out the plane that, uh, that Bruce tore up there. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Kind of cool stuff. So, <laughs> oh no, Vic, <laughs> Vic, take take diving lessons, buddy. You can go <laughs> right. Go down there and get a piece of it, like a piece of the orchid too. Yeah. That's what I'll do. Vic, I will learn to to scuba dive and go down there and get you a piece of that plane. <laughs> Coincidentally, it was a popular plane for apparently bringing uh, small amounts of narcotics across the U.S. border from other countries. Ironically. Um, if I remember that, if I remember that, the I don't know if it was a movie or the book. I didn't read the book, but I know I would look things up. Um, was it uh, Mr. Kane supposedly did a little bit of money laundering with his plane? Supposedly, Hoagie was the, a smuggler of. Yeah, I did, it never said what, uh, but yeah, he he uh, padded his income with some illegal activities as well. Got to oil the machine, I guess, right? <laughs> uh, we got a the screenwriter of JTR shouldn't have been in that play. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah, on the passenger side, right there, where Bruce was eating the door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, and the last, the last thing that I put together, um, Mike sent me this picture. Uh, this afternoon, and I was I was completely blown away because um, 
not something I don't think I've ever heard you talk about, Mike, or mention, or um, re regarding to the USS Indianapolis. And that's, I mean, I'll let you talk about it, but my response when Mike sent this was, pardon my French, holy shit, Mike, we've got to put that on the show tonight. I'll tie that in the vehicles. You know, we'll talk about the USS Indianapolis, but Mike, tell us a little bit about what you got here. Um, this uh, kind of ties in with what's going on in the Daily Jaws this week. Uh, Ross posted a, uh, a a piece, and he found on YouTube a uh, interview with uh, one of the sailors um, that had been on the Indianapolis, and it's about a half hour interview. And um, apparently, the the Indianapolis was uh, involved in so many different uh, important parts of the war. They were at Iwo Jima, uh, the uh, Sea of Japan. Um, and after they uh, dropped off uh, the atomic bomb, they were heading to Japan to take place in apparently the invasion of Japan after the atomic bomb dropped. Um, and the gentleman that, that tells it, uh, it's, it's, it's still, it's still like yesterday to him. And, you know, Quint's, Quint's speech is, is very harrowing and you, you kind of listen to it and to understand, but then, you know, it's, it's somebody that's reciting lines, but to hear this gentleman tell the story, um, it, it just, it, it, it I was in tears. Uh, what what they endured, what they had to go through. Um, but this gentleman next to me, uh, in 2010, um, I went up to o Omaha. I have a friend, Bruce Crawford, who twice a year puts on a, uh, a charity screening of movies. And he always has um, celebrity guests. Um, for like, uh, he showed The Godfather. He had people from Brando's family, Young Frankenstein. He had Cloris Leachman. For Jaws, he had Carl Gottlieb, and that was where I really got to know Carl. We went to dinner, and I drove him to the airport the next day, and that's really where our friendship really, really took off. But this gentleman next to me, his name is Clarence Hupka, and he was also on the Indianapolis. And he, he said a few words before the screening, and we were sitting um, – it, it, it's a, they moved the location now. It used to be the Jocelyn Theater uh, at the Jocelyn Museum. And we were in the front row of the balcony, and I was uh, basically looking down on him. And to watch Jaws, to watch Quinn's monologue on Indianapolis, looking down at this man and knowing that Quinn is telling his story, it was, it was surreal. It was like, oh, my God. Um, it, you really, uh, the, the reality of what happened really hit me. So, um, yeah, go to the Daily Jaws, look for uh, uh, the link there. I was actually going to post it on, on the page today, and then I, I got tied up at work and I forgot. So I might go back and, and post it again later. Um, but, yeah, Clarence Hupka was one of the 316 men that of the 1,200 that went in the water that, that survived. And um, very nice man. I mean, uh, but yeah, it's just, uh, it was just, uh, an amazing experience to, to not only meet him, um, but to, and, and you know, when he, when he watches the film, you have to wonder what's going through his head. You know, Quinn's yeah. telling oh, the yeah. story. Yeah. Quinn's telling the story. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. 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 But, um, Yeah. So check it out in the Daily Jaws. Um, let's see what else. Oh, since we're talking Daily Jaws real quick. Um, yeah. There are, um, uh, I wrote a couple, uh, I wrote a couple pieces uh, that are up this week. Uh, impact of the music on Jaws. Uh, could Jaws happen today as far as um, uh, the different shark attacks? Um I, I, my opinion was no, because with all the social media, everything out there, after one person was attacked, they closed the beaches. It wouldn't be the whole, let's let five other people get, get eaten. Um, 100% agree on that. Yeah. Uh, shark movies that were popular before Jaws. Um, but yeah, definitely check out this interview um, uh, with this gentleman. 
it, it was, uh, you know, it was just it took your breath away uh, because, like I said, it's it's very it's very powerful in Jaws, um, and it was very powerful to a lot of people because nobody really knew uh, if if you were on Indianapolis and the ship sank, all your parents. Yes, the interview is on YouTube, um, but if you go to the Daily Jaws, it's right there on the on the main page. Uh, you click on, I'll take you to YouTube. Um, uh, you were just told that, uh, that, you know, the ship was sunk and your son died. You didn't know uh, the whole background, the whole story. And, uh, Richard Dreyfus tells a story of, uh, Peter Benchley's, uh, the film opened on a Friday. Peter Benchley's, uh, housekeeper didn't come in on Monday and, um, they called to see what was wrong and, she told him that, you know, my, my son was on Indianapolis. I just found out how he died. So, um, yeah. So check that out. The daily jaws. Um, what else did I want to bring up? How many jaws group? Congratulations, Martin and his gang. They hit 18,000 members. Wow. Um, wow. They haven't been around that long either. Yeah. And I want to thank everybody that has gone to the jaws 50 page. We have added over a thousand members in a month, in the month of May, we have had a thousand members join. Um, we are we are approaching four thousand uh, members, and um, I, I thank you all uh, for the support. Um, I do have a, a website is coming. Uh, the Jaws Fifty website is coming. Um, as uh, Jaws Fifty, uh, here's something official. <laughs> um, nothing has been. Confirmed details wise, um, but I've spoken with the Chamber of Commerce and Martha's Vineyard, and there will be a 50th anniversary celebration. Um, oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm assuming with Universal's blessing, um, but uh, if not, um, you know, like I said, we could, we could bring 500 people just from just from our page that would go. Um, and as soon as uh, I find out more, as soon as I found out definite dates, definite guests, what, uh, what the event's going to entail. We'll definitely let you know. So um, mark your calendars, June, June 2025, yeah. two years, yeah. two short years. I know we were planning on going back to the vineyard next summer. We've been trying to go every other year, and we are holding off on the count of 2025. So it's not even – we're thinking about it. I definitely don't plan it on being there as so such. As we get closer, yeah, we definitely have to kind of maybe try and coordinate some things uh, because, I mean, uh, you know, at least for me personally, I'm sure some of you guys share this, you know, it's, it's amazing uh, spending time with everyone here every single week, interacting. You can only imagine what it's going to be like when it's all face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, in the homeland, for yeah. that matter. So it, it's going to be an amazing, amazing feat. Yeah, even if it is just us. I mean, honestly, I uh, Universal being here will be kind of neat. We might bring in some big people, but it's going to be an amazing event, even if it's just simply us showing up and you know having that common interest. I think it's going to oh, be yeah. incredible. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure Universal will, will be involved. Um, they would be foolish. They would be foolish not not to. Um, I just think um, you know, but with if Universal's involvement, then everything's official. Um, yeah. You know, you can the official Jaws Fest. Um, but you know, and they did it 2005, they did it in 2012 and it was a, an odd year to do it, but 2012 was the hundredth anniversary of universal. That's why universal wanted to do it in 2012. So here it's going to be 13 years. Um, yeah, it's going to be fun. Even, even if it's just us, you know, just you and I, you and I sitting at the wharf doing this show live. Uh, to people in the audience, we that would be it. awesome. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it live. Yeah, a little trivia night, have a little. Yeah, who knows? Hey, that'd be great. Or just broadcasting from there. I very much looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, uh, I got a request here for the song for the for the night. Mike um, says, "Sing, show me the way to go home." Ooh. I didn't do better. So than how you feeling thought. about that? That, if that's Vic, you know, we got to get him on here live one night. He, he, he comes up with good suggestions. I can't get him on. If, you know what, Vic? If you come on, the three of us will sing it. 
And I will try and harmonize. How's that sound? There you go. <laughs> All right, let's see if it will play. This is actually my ringtone. Singing a song. Singing a song. Show me the way to go home. I like the ringtone because you, you can hear the boards busting in the background, too. <laughs> awesome stuff. Well, hey, guys. Awesome night tonight, Mike. I had a lot of fun. That was awesome. Me too. Thank uh, you. You put together a yeah. great show. Thank you. Oh, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. And definitely in my warehouse for talking vehicles. So, uh, hey, guys. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, you know, Spread it around. We definitely want to get some more people on here. And we might have some pretty cool things coming on here in the near future. I'm not going to say anything yet, so I know what's going to happen. But we might start to see some guests coming back on. Um, we have a couple a couple things we're trying to get in the works here. So we'll kind of keep you posted on that. I'm going to try and get posted a little bit quicker than I did tonight, uh, what we're going to be doing. So thanks for coming out. Stay awesome and get those fins up, guys. Fins up. Have a good night. Have a wonderful weekend.